I'm used to being uh, on that side. <laughs> uh, good morning, everybody. Thanks for coming. Um, I am a uh, photographer, a journalist, and a storyteller based in Nairobi um, and work internationally. For decades, um, I've covered conflicts, oppression, development projects around the world. I'm going to show you a few pictures of the work uh, that I do and then talk about some of the uh, some issues um, around photography that I think is important for all of us to to address. This is in Tahir Square. This is the revolution in Libya. This as well. This is when Libya was, was just turning from a peaceful kind of uprising into an armed revolution, which got to us to the complexity of today. This is in South Sudan, where I've worked a long time. This is the hope before the uh, tragedy that we are now seeing. This is a, a country that's lived at war for a really long time. I think it's something that's easy to forget um, in America where we export our wars. Um, it's a woman grieving because her husband was killed in post-election violence. This is hunting for the LRA, Lord's Resistance Army in Central Africa. It's grieving someone killed by the LRA. This is the Nuba Mountains where I've worked a long time. There's been war for about 30 years, but also a lot of resilience. So my job was to bring images of newsworthy events to audiences like you, engaged readers in the West who cared about these issues or worked on these issues. Um, I also covered stories of hope. I worked uh, a lot for IntraHealth, um, documenting um, ARV delivery, um, maternal health interventions, um, and my favorite, which is working with, with, was, was do working with uh, frontline health workers. This is in India. Um, the Malian Pasi will recognize this man <laughs> who does amazing work in Mali and around Fistula. So um, this, this job has been really interesting, um, and it's felt really important. You know, I'm around, I'm around historical moments when, when, when change is happening um, that, that you know, that will last forever and affect, affect thousands and thousands of people. Um, but I want to go back to the image that we started with, this image. This is in South Sudan. Um, uh, this boy's mother was fleeing violence in the Nuba Mountains in Sudan, where humanitarian aid was blocked, people were starving. How many of you guys have worked in a famine situation? It's really, really hard to see. It's like all of the violence of the tanks and the guns are all kind of smashed into one little child's body, and you want to do something about it, but, but you can't. And this picture was really hard to take, but it was important. It was important to show the world what was happening in this place. But this picture also did something else. It's not the whole story. It also perpetuated stereotypes of Africa. We've all seen hundreds of pictures like this of starving children in Africa. And thousands of uh, Western photographers like me have taken those pictures. And they're all true, and they're all important, but they're also, in some ways, all wrong. They have shown a light on unjust suffering, but they've also contributed to a language about Africa full of stereotypes with little input for the people who live there. And there's a long, long history we have of doing this. The visual language of photojournalism, in which I work in, and a lot of you guys also probably work in or, or consume these images, is one that's tied to an othering of, of, of a people and a Western reductionism. And it happens here in the US, it happens everywhere in the world. And so I think as visual storytellers, we have a problem. 
what we are saying is, is true, but the language we are using is perpetuating untruths, and it matters. People go to war based around images. People give aid based around images. People do a lot of things based around images. So I think um, we're at this point now where it's becoming actually quite untenable. Um, the, the, you know, I think as people who've worked in Africa and coming back to the West, you know, when you go and talk to your, your friends about what's happening there, they say things like, oh, Africa? There's always that Africa? <laughs> and, and you're like, yeah, Africa, the place where there's way too many malls and way too many building projects and, 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 and more. You know, you, there's, there's, but the, the, the ideas people have of it are so egregiously different than the reality that that we, we, we can, we, we, we're basically based, we're, we're essentially at the point where we're make, taking actions based on untruths. And I think this is a, a really, really huge problem. Um, I'm going to show you a photograph of, um, this is Barbie Savior. Um, and this is a photograph, the next photograph is a photograph that a lot of us have probably taken. Um, and it's ourselves with some African children. Um, this is a, a blog called Humanitarians on Tinder. Uh, these are images <laughs> of, of people who are using these images essentially to um, increase their own status and to show that they're charitable people. Um, but this comes at a cost. This perpetuates ideas of power. And those ideas of power stick with all of us. And they influence everything we think about a place. And we can't do that anymore. This is uh, an extreme example, um, but people are, we all do this. People in, 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 in Nairobi, where I live, do this about people who live in Kabira. You know, we do this about people who live across the tracks. Constantly we're doing this. So how do we recon reconcile these contradictions? The truth in them and the falseness. We need to figure this out. We need to figure this out not just to give voice to the voiceless, not because we want to support and be inclusive, but because it's just inaccurate, it's just wrong. We are, based, we are basing our decisions, our policies, around something that is not true. And we can't keep going on like that. It's becoming, honestly, kind of embarrassing. So um, I've tried to tackle this in a few different ways uh, in my own work, and I kind of want to put forth a challenge for you all to do the same in, in your work, and both what you produce and also how you consume things. Um, I think um, I'm going to give you a four different rules that um, have been interesting for me to, and have kind of solved some of these, some of these issues in a, in a small, small way, but we're just at the beginning of this, and it's, it's going to take a long, concerted effort with a lot of work. Um, so number one, support and learn from amazing local storytellers. So there's a lot of really amazing storytellers, and I'm specifically going to talk about Africa because that's where I work, but this is everywhere. Um, this is my friend Niendo who is an animator, and she does incredible stuff. She recently did a project uh, with the, the Gates Foundation, Huffington Post, around neglected diseases. Um, I think there's a tons of people in Africa that we can work with to tell better stories, and at the same time, to support the work they're doing, which is, which is great. Um, another thing I've been working a lot on is embracing emerging technologies. Um, and I'm excited about these because of the possibility it allows for new visual languages. So I've, I've done a lot of work with virtual reality. We just did a, a um, hackathon in, in Nairobi. Um, and what's cool about this stuff is that, you know, video and photography came to Africa after 30, 40, 50, 60 years of a language being created in the West before it even arrived. So everybody there had to, had to play catch up and had to use that language. There is no language for VR. People might say there is, but it's only been around for a couple, of, you know, this latest iteration has only been around for a few years. Um, so we get to create that language, and if we do that in an inclusive way, we can avoid a lot of these problems that we've had in the past. Um, this is a big one, um, especially for all the comms people out there. Um, investing in creativity and embracing the unexpected. So we can look for new ways to tell stories. We can look for surprising ways to tell stories. Yes, it's easy to go with the typical, but it does harm. And I think that's something that we have to recognize. It's not that it's, just, it's easy, let's just be lazy. It actually does harm. So we have to be really proactive about this. We have to embrace new ways of doing these things. 
Um, this is a piece I did for Vice um, on the beach life in Mogadishu. This is a part of, this is kind of a, 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 you know, a perspective of Mogadishu probably most of you haven't seen, but it happens, it happens every day. This beach also gets blown up, people die there, but this is what happens most days, and that's what's important to show. And this is unexpected, and it changes people's perceptions of a place, and I think it's really critical um, that we do that. Collaboration, this is the number one thing, um, I think, and we have to do it all the time, in everything we do, there has to be collaboration, it has to be a partnership. There's no room for, for just one of us telling the story that we want to tell because we have the power, the funding, or the resources to do it. Everything has to be a collaboration at this point. And again, if it's not, it's just going to become embarrassing. Um, um, this is a project I worked on in the Nuba Mountains called Nuba Reports. Um, and what we did was partnered with local people on the ground there um, to create networks documenting human rights abuses. We also partnered with media like the New York Times, um, PBS, Al Jazeera, to create stories about what was happening. I could never cover this place alone. It would be impossible. Um, the local network on the ground would have difficulty reaching the, the mediums, the, the, the kind of the people that I was able to access. Together, we were able to cover this conflict. We documented over 4,000 bombs dropped. We did multiple stories for big media outlets, working together. And I think that's the only way forward at this point. Thank you very much.